Thanks, everybody. Uh, welcome to Build. I'm your host, Ricky Kimmler. Our next guest uh, is, in my opinion, one of the great actresses working today, if not just one of the great actresses of all time, from her role in the films of Mike Lee to the steely-eyed sister in Phantom Thread or her role in the Maleficent films. Leslie Manville always and seemingly effortlessly steals her scenes. And in Ordinary Love, it is no different. She plays a woman battling cancer alongside a husband played by Liam Neeson. It's a small, beautiful, and again, seemingly effortless performance, which I'm going to quiz her about her talk to her about, because I don't know how someone does that. Please welcome the one and only Leslie Manville. Um, I said that in the, in the green room, and I said it here again, effortless. You know, I mean that as really the highest compliment. We love an actor all the time. They win all the awards where they are showing all of the effort that they could possibly show in the performance. But no matter where your character is coming from, no matter how much it requires physicality, you seem to somehow embody that in a way that doesn't show acting and uh, how do you know how you do that does that come with preparation how does that work well thank you for the compliments first of all nicely received always um uh you know it's i do think about it because i think um a lot of the press in england have liked to say i've got this late flowering career and i know what they mean i i they mean that i'm uh, i'm having a uh, a different level of success now. But what it doesn't take into account, I've been working professionally since I was 16, and I've done, I've sort of not stopped working. And I've, I, I, I have the most astonishing career, certainly in England, that's been full of amazing theater, groundbreaking theater, new, with, uh, with, highly prestigious new writers. Um, I've done Chekhov, Ibsen, Strindberg, Shakespeare, Johnson. I've been, I've, I've been littered through my career with projects with Mike Lee. We, I've worked with him since I was in my 20s. Um, and the last time I worked with him was about six years ago. It's been a wonderful, rich and varied career. So a long answer to your question. I think somewhere in you, if you absorb all of that and you take all of that wealth of experience that you've had and all those rehearsal rooms and all those filming days and all those different characters, um, I feel now there's something about my work that, and don't take this the wrong way, it has an ease, it's easier. Mm -hmm. Those characters are still complicated and they're not like me, most of them, which is what I enjoy. You know, I, I don't want to turn up and do the same performance time and again. It, it's not my thing. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm finding it's kind of, I think about the person and, and somewhere down in here, it's, it's all there. And Liam and I were doing press yesterday. He, he couldn't do today because he's had to go back to Winnipeg to film. But we were touching on this quite a lot that, um, it's not just the parts you've played, it's the life you've had. Um, I mean, we're both in our 60s. And we've had great ups and great downs. We've experienced love, we've experienced loss, grief, pain, happiness, joy, bliss, heartache and sorrow. Like everybody, our situations are not that different. Um, and, you know, we recognize the fact that we have good lives and thankfully at the moment, we him and I have our health. But all of that life experience is, is in our bones, in the way it's in everyone's bones. But my job as an actor is to take all of that stuff that I have lived through and experienced and in a way kind of regurgitate it. And so if I'm playing Kathy in Mum, who, who is a soft, understanding, gentlewoman who's harboring a lot of pain. I, you know, somehow I can tap into that. And right. this woman in Ordinary Love, you know, she's, she's, she's had a life. She's lost a child back about 10 years before the story of the film begins. And now she's going through this new thing with discovering she has breast cancer. But it's all kind of, it, it's, it's, kind of happens by osmosis and but the ability an actor has is to take what they've received from life and retell it through different filters different characters 
when you say easier, and I know that you were hesitant to use that word, so I don't want to harp on it too much. But is that just uh, to simplify easier access to these to these points with you? Yes, I think so. And do you find that when you were sixteen or twenty, and no. you were taking on big roles, you had to sort of cling to something and take it more seriously, or fight for the process in a way? Yes, I, I it was. I learned an enormous amount through my work with Mike Lee, um, but yes, it all seemed. It seemed harder then, and I, I, I just think I understand the characters I'm playing more. And also, when you're 20, playing a 20-year-old, 20 that 20-year-old is probably not so complex. Mm -hmm. you, you're 60 playing a 60-year-old. A 60-year-old has had so much more stuff. Um, so, you know, every, uh, you're, you're primed to serve that character better. When I say ease, I must try and justify that because I, I just, I, 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 f I kind of have, I, under, I know what I need to do, how I need to play someone. You have reference points as well for that person. Uh, probably yeah, more of them, at least. I remember talking to you one time about another year, mm. and you had said that while that character wasn't based on anyone specific, you just had ideas based on people that you knew and could kind of cobble. She was together, quite an amalgamation right? of, yeah. of of people. Um, yeah. Um, you know, in the trailer for this, it says, or maybe even it says it here, that you have incredible chemistry. Yeah. Did you and Liam know each other prior no. to this? Did you rec could you the two of you recognize the chemistry while you were shooting, or is it something that honestly you're just two good actors who recognize the role? Oh no, we're actors. not acting, and we really hate each other. I mean, we did we 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 didn't know each other. We hadn't worked together. I suppose the um, the directors and producers must have been nervous thinking about it in hindsight, and because so many press. Um, uh, journalists I've spoken to have have raised that because I think our chemistry in the film is is pretty extraordinary. We really do look like a couple who properly love each other and who have been together for th more than thirty years. All those moments of bickering that really captured. Yes, it, right? yeah, it, it, it's it's great. But no, we didn't. But you know, the minute we met each other, it was here in New York because I was doing Long Day's Journey in Tonight at BAM, and he was doing he was living here. He lives here. So the director, two directors we had, well, husband and wife team, they came over and the first time I met him, he came to see my play and he walked backstage into my dressing room and um, he gave me a big hug and it was instant, we instantly liked each other and got on and um, I think as actors we're very similar. You know, we're, we don't, there's, I mean, he, he could just, he's a major movie star. He, he, there's no ego on the set. There's no pulling rank, or you know, it was just two actors trying to make this film work. But uh, the the producers, I guess, were lucky because we could have not got on in quite that way. And then you have to go from arguing to like loving each other, or making each other laugh, back to arguing or he, something. He, yes, I mean, I think my memory is that we shot it quite fairly chronologically. Mm. But I do remember the first day of filming was 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 all the scenes in their house when they're just watching telly and or whatever, putting the Christmas decorations out. And um, so the first fir very first scene we shot, they're sitting on the sofa watching telly, and you think, right, they've been doing this for thirty years, and they're having the little argument about what how a Fitbit works because they do their power walking, and. Um, I kind of think, right, okay, got to, oh, wow, got to make this 30-year relationship look alive. And we did, but it was easy because I, it, he was so easy to work with, and I know he feels the same about me. And um, I, it was, yeah, we, it's, we, they hit the jackpot, really. I mean, making a 30-year relationship look alive, in my mind, and from watching the movie, is making it look calm. Y yes. Right? Is making it look like there is nothing that is nervous about the two of you. Yeah. You know? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I, I know. It's weird. It's a funny job I've got, isn't it? Well, oftentimes <laughs> I've, I've seen, and I think I saw something recently, I can't remember the name of it, and I don't think I would say it right here, but where it was a married couple and they were supposed to be married for uh, an extended period of time. And I could just tell by the way that the actors were going about the, the, the scene, it felt very performative, it felt very written, and it felt like this was this piece of writing is meant to establish that they've known each other this long. Yeah. Whereas there is something, again, embodied about the, what the two of you are doing. It's about the fact that they can make a joke 
at each other's expense mm. and it doesn't hurt each other's feelings. And it's a lighthearted joke, but That's it's how right. they get by on a daily basis. And listen, apart from the fact that the, the film deals with the, this epic thing that's happening to them, that Joan's going through breast cancer, it, it is also a beautiful love story. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and, and a middle-aged love story isn't often told, especially about it, uh, two people who still... Uh, fancy each other, still want to have sex, and still um, find each other very funny, and they are the center of each other's lives. You know, it's that's quite unusual in itself. Yeah, they're usually about some sort of midlife crisis, or someone has to leave. Yes. Because it's an unloving relationship or something, because oftentimes I don't think people know how to write conflict or story of just a loving relationship. Yeah, it, I, I agree entirely. It's quite hard. And, and on the page, it's not so, you know, you've got to have them divorcing because that makes it interesting, you know. I mean, this film is um, full of m m real minute details and things that when you read them on the page, you could think, oh, that's, why is that interesting? You know, she's waiting in the waiting room to go to the doctor to find out whether she's got cancer or not, and he's had to go to the toilet, and you, you, and she's going, she's thinking, oh, please come back, because if they call me in and I have to hear this news by myself. So the waiting, and by the time you see that scene in the course of the film, you know, the waiting is significant because you don't want this woman to get this news on her own. Um, and she's, plus she's trying to read in the oncologist just saying, Mrs. Thompson, will you come in now? She's trying to read whether that woman is got bad news or good news, you know. And and that journey of going through something so epic is 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 a tough one. One of the great things that really helped me with the film is that um all of the um biopsy nurses and the chemo nurses and technicians and all the people that did all the scanning, they were all real. Oh, wow. So they um, talked me through it. But I also wanted They're to- They're performance notes? Well, they, well, you know, <laughs> Leslie, that's not believable. <laughs> I wasn't having a great big needle right. stuck in my breast and having a biopsy, but when she said, she showed me the needle, and she said, and when we actually do the biopsy, we press the end of the needle and it makes this mm. really quite strong, met metallic sounding, noise it goes you know it's a horrible thought and even just the sound of that you know so she would she would in the scene you know she would do it and we work something out whereby she was um put something else over my breast i don't know a, a, a straw or something that was indicated the needle going in and then she actually made the, the real sound with this thing you know it's it's horrible so all of that was really helpful and and you know i i just thought joan's not been through this i haven't been through this thank the lord but so let's go into all this new territory un unprescribed you know i don't want to i don't want to pre-decide how I'm going to play these scenes. Let me be put in the scanner and, you know, be looking at this scanner and it, yeah. all of those things. So it was, it, it had a, a freshness about it because uh, I, I've not experienced it all before. Do you find that that generally works or do you find that sometimes you'll be like, throw, it, throw, throw me into it for the first time and let's capture me experiencing it for the first time. Mm. But then you finish a take and you're like, well, maybe I didn't. Let's let, let me try to perform what I. Oh, listen. I have you done. then. I mean, once you've discovered the moment and what it's about, of course, then then your job as an actor is to repeat it, right. and you might have to repeat it five or six times. And obviously, that's where um, the acting comes in. Um, but it's nice to. I enjoyed the fact that I could come to it all fresh, and and I think generally speaking, I do encourage directors to not over rehearse those moments with me and just shoot them the first time because you can get something that's that's spontaneous but you know obviously i have to try and repeat that is that something that you encourage directors when you're working with them you 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 say i like to try well if this, they if say do you show you know once you know what the shot is and where you've got to be and any marks that you've got to hit mm -hmm. you know they might say well sh shall we have a rehearsal or do you want to shoot it and I'm, I, I will always say, let's, let's shoot it, because you never know. And I'm, I'm generally quite 
something happens in the first take of things for me that's quite useful and interesting. So I always encourage them to shoot first time. What happens if they say no? Um, I can't imagine you would if you're a director. I can't like saying no. No, they're not usually that yeah. kind of directors. There's nothing to be lost, right. even if in their head it's a rehearsal, go. and I'm saying, look, why don't we just shoot this rehearsal? That's what I say sometimes. Well, it's a rehearsal. Well, let's shoot it. Mm -hmm. And then they kind of think, oh, we're just shooting the rehearsal. Right. No one's shooting on film anymore, so it's not like they're burning. Well, we did on Phantom Thread, yeah. That is true. He, and, but he somehow is able to shoot as much film as he wants, from what I understand. Yes, we had 14 weeks of which probably we could have... I think we over, uh, the producers at the end said we've probably shot three weeks worth that won't be used. That's fun for, I mean, is that fun for you guys? Because he's experimenting a lot and playing and figuring things he out, He is. Right? He, he kind of works it out as he goes along, which is thrilling. And I, I'm all in for that. Yeah. Um, some actors wouldn't be, but, you know, he, they weren't on our set, that's for sure. It was all of us were just open to where it would go. And I loved that about Paul because he would... He would watch what I was doing. He was very unprescriptive about how I should play Cyril in Phantom Thread. So he would just let all, all of the actors just do it. And then he'd start to see what you were doing and get ideas. And I mean, little moments in that, like once when I took, S Cyril took her glasses off. And because that character's hair was always slicked back, and it was the 50s anyway, and she was a very elegant, well-couture-dressed woman. Chic. Chic. Ah, oh, no. <laughs> Good reference, though. Um, when you take your glasses off sometimes, certainly with me, you take your glasses off and then you get bits of hair left sticking out like that. So I took the glasses off once, and then with both hands, I won't do it with both because I'm holding the mic, went, went like that. Well, he loved that. He loved it. He said, let's hold, on, let's hold on to that. So that she takes them off very slowly, very precise woman, and does all that. But that's just a, a little indication of how Paul works. You give him stuff. And that's then done in the scene where Daniel's trying to get, or um, uh, the, the character that Daniel is playing. Daniel, Reynolds, playing, yeah. Re is trying to get the woman that he's just married basically out of the house, right? And yeah, she wants her, her to get rid of him. Yeah, and he's telling he her that He wants his sister office. to do his dirty work for him. Right, and she says, I don't want to listen to it because it hurts my ears. She right? does, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I just saw that movie in the theater like a couple months ago. Oh, yeah. did you? Yeah, it holds up. <laughs> it's yes. wonderful. Yeah, um, good, thank you. You know, there's a wonderful scene in this, in, it, uh, in, in Ordinary Love, where you are sitting with uh, the, the technician or the woman who is essentially giving you chemo. And, yes. And Liam is sitting next to you, and you're watching gardening on the television. Yes. And he's doing this thing that is so... Um, supportive yet manly in the sense that he doesn't know exactly what to say and he only knows how to make jokes to try to make things better yeah and it's yeah. the wrong time to make yeah, jokes and yeah she's trying to tell him to leave it's such a beautiful scene i know how do you see that on paper as to how dramatic going back to you know whether or not you can tell how dramatic something is on the page versus when you get to shooting it and then you kind of figure it out yes well, I mean, a lot of this script didn't look that dramatic on the page. You know, even the argument they have. They have one argument in the film, and it's a, a really painful point for Joan. You know, she's in bed, she's hot one minute, she's sweating the next and freezing the next. You know, it horror, and she's in bed with hats and jumpers and duvets wrapped around her. And she can't, he's given, he, in his painful his sweet attempts to kind of help he's given her a notebook to write down which tablets she takes when and she's forgotten to write it down and so she just says give me any pill and he says well it can't be any pill and it's this row about nothing but it's because they need they need that release because he's in a different sort of pain to her He's in pain because it's his wife and he loves her deeply and profoundly, but he can do nothing to help this situation. He's powerless and he's this man and he's a, he's a, he's a tall guy, Liam. You know, he, the, he's all beef, you know, it's, and he's got this slightly fragile wife who he can do nothing for. So his way of trying to do something is to buy her the notebook and then she's not using it. And she's lashing out and saying, you know, I'm the one who's going through this. I'm gonna, 
I've got the cancer. I'm going to have to have a double mastectomy. Uh, you know, it's me. And, and then he picks up on that and says, oh, yes, it's all about you. It's, it's, it's a shocking moment, but we know it's not one of those moments where you think, are this couple going to split up? Is it? You know that. You know that this couple are together till the grave. Yeah. But... You, I also like, though, that what comes out in that argument is clearly pieces of their life prior to the cancer. Yes. In, yeah. in just, like, succinct lines. Yeah. You know, I think one thing he says is your hatred of me is simmering underneath this all the time, which probably stems in some ways from the what they went through when their child died. To get yes. I'm sure there were cathartic moments where they were yeah. yelling at each other. Big fights, you know, and yeah. resentments that developed that... Every couple has resentments, you know? But yes. they're all coming out in that moment, yet I think a lesser movie would think, well, we have to follow up on these things later on. Sure, right? and I, it's and great it does, that you don't have to. Yes. I mean, Owen McCafferty, who wrote it, is a very celebrated Irish playwright. But this is his first film, and um, it's no secret that it is the story of him and Peggy, his wife, and this is what they went through, although the added bit the detail of them losing a child is fictitious. Um, but, you know, Owen is a brilliant writer, and I, I'm, I'm, although this is based on his, him and Peggy's story, he will have dramatized it as well, nonetheless. Um, but he's a great observer of um, human, human relationships. And do the two of you have questions when you're doing a scene like that about what exactly do are these resentments, or what exactly does he mean by the hatred simmering underneath the whole time? Yeah, you do have questions. Yeah, we had, we had a, uh, unusually on this, we had uh, two directors, a husband and wife team, Lisa Barris de Saar and Glenn Leyburn. And um, you could think that might be confusing if you've got conflicting directorial notes coming your way, but Glenn generally dealt with the cinema, cinematography and the design and that side of things, and Lisa directed, Liam and I. Uh, so that was great. But so, yeah, sure, we would, we would discuss things just so that we had some, you know, some clarity in our heads. But I have to say, I think Liam and I had and employed our instincts with, with, with this film a lot. And I think generally our instincts were, were very good. And I remember rec filming that row scene, which... We didn't do that much, and they shot it very cleverly, shot it very simply. You don't want to start doing, you know, it's all happening in these two people and the words that they're saying and the situation that they're in. So you keep it simple in terms of shots. You just want to serve the actors and the story at that point. Um, so we didn't do it a lot of times, but once we did it, it was like somebody put a match to a furnace of wood with paraffin all over it, it just suddenly went warm into this other gear. And I, you know, I just remember doing it the first time and screaming at him, you know, no, you're not going through it, I'm going. And I thought, you know, in the back of your head, you're always monitoring stuff. I just thought, this is, this is, a, that we're doing, you know, he, he was, he was giving me some great stuff to feed off. And, we were really working well well together. It, and that's when acting, for me, is thrilling. That's so interesting. In the back of your head, you're always monitoring stuff. You have to. Yeah. But I think that's something that actors never talk about because there is the myth of being completely in it. You cannot be completely in character because I've been Leslie all my life since the day I was born. I cannot get rid of Leslie and be someone else. I can... And this comes really from my extensive work with Mike Lee, who is the king of working with actors. You, there's no script and you develop the film or the play with him very slowly over many months. And the first job you do with him is you create a character with him through, through debate. And, but that takes months. You're talking, 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 talking about people that you know and you might make a cocktail of all these people a bit like you were saying earlier the character Mary in another year she was a cocktail of about four or five people that I knew but that takes a long long time and then finally with Mike Lee you will start to do some very major improvisations that can last for hours hours half a day 
But when you've done those improvisations, you then have to one-to-one -one go to Mike and have a major debrief and discuss what the character was thinking and why she said this and why did she react like that to uh, something that somebody else said. So you've, I've got to have my Leslie antennae on the go. And I think that's why I'm good at playing troubled characters, you know, I, I, I springs to mind not just Mary in another year, but Ma another Mary, Mary Tyrone in Long Day's Journey Into Night, you know, a morphine addict who is in a painfully unhappy marriage, has had a lifetime of loneliness and unhappiness. I can be absolutely in that, in the moment, and cooking on all cylinders, but when I walk away and I leave that character at home, I'm, it's gone, it's done. And that is healthy. Yeah, of course. It, but even when you're in there cooking on all cylinders, there's still a tiny part in the back course. of your head that can monitor. Of course. Well, I've because there's other things to be aware of. Yeah. You know, technical things. You might have a mark to hit. Because if you don't hit that mark, the, fo the focus will be out. Um, there might be a, a light that you've got to kind of avoid a bit. Otherwise, there's a big shadow over Liam's face. Mm -hmm. um, all sorts of things. And that's why I, I, I felt, personally, I was really in my 40s, I think, before something about filming really kicked in with me and I started to be very, very comfortable doing my job with a, with a, with a camera there and being aware of it but not aware of it. And but you'd already delivered at that point some of your, some incredible performances. Well... Thank you. I had been, I've been working, as I said, since I was yeah. 17, 16, but yes, yeah, something kicked in. It came out of, partly out of a conversation I had with Helen Mirren. We played sisters probably about 20 years ago now. And we got on, liked each other, had, used to have great talks. And she was saying at that time that it, she loved filming because it was about having this, yes, I'm playing the scene with you, and that's where the emotion and the backwards and forwards is going. That's where that energy is. But then you've got this thing over here watching you, and that's got to get it. That's your audience. For, for the audience, yeah, that's your audience. So you have to do this, but then you've got to be aware of that too. And I guess it's uber uber comfort and confidence. And I've always been a slow burn, I think, with most things in my life. And, and, and that's not to say, as you kindly said, that I hadn't done good performances before I was Incredible. 40. Yeah. But something kicked in. And I remember having had that conversation with Helen, I then felt it very profoundly when I was shooting a particular scene in Topsy Turvy. The, the one of the penultimate the, the penultimate scene in the film when I played Kitty Gilbert who's the wife of uh, W S Gilbert which Jim Broadbent played and she's they're childless and he she's had a lonely <laughs> God I play a lot of lonely people um, but it was it was a very emotional scene and um, all of that conversation with Helen and everything I'd been thinking about for a long time something just kicked in. And I think since then, I've had a real, I'm really comfortable with a camera rolling and I, it's, I, it's, I love it, you know, I love, I love thinking that there's this camera and it's gonna capture what I'm gonna do and I'm gonna, you know, up the ante now and they're gonna see it, I, it's, it's thrilling. It's interesting that Topsy Turvy would be the movie where you first realized that because that's, a director that you've been working with since the beginning of your career, basically. Yeah. And that's probably up until that point, his most visually lurid, flourishing movie where the camera is probably, I mean, it really starts with Naked with him where the camera becomes a bit more of a subjective participant rather than a kind of objective viewer yes, of yeah. family life or, or, or scenes between people. Yeah. But Topsy Turvy specifically is the one where the camera starts to really shake and move around. That's right. In a different way. Yeah. Did you... 
sense while you were working with him that he was operating on a different level as well? And so therefore that may have brought out the conversation that you had with Helen a little That's bit? That's a really interesting point. I hadn't thought of it in that way, but that could be that could well be the case because you're absolutely right. Mike, and I love listening to Mike discuss with Dick Pope, who is has nearly always been his uh, director of photography. I love hearing them discuss how they're going to shoot a scene. But he does normally let the camera be very quiet yeah. to because it's about being the observer. But it was much more active. I'm going to have to really think about that and go home and watch Topsy Turvy again. I mean, I've interviewed but Mike it, and I've asked him about the difference between the aesthetic of the early stuff and Naked Eye, and he does not he does not agree with me. Does he not? <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. Well, he's stubborn. Yes. What can I say? He's, I have not changed a thing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we have time for a couple questions from the audience. The first one is from uh, Rita, right here. Hi. Um, I, a friend of mine, we've seen the movie and we loved it, but we both walked out with different viewpoints. Um, she found it very sad. I found it a very uplifting movie. What do you think? Well, that it's. I'm glad you've said that because I've. Uh, this film has already opened in England last year, and I also took it to Toronto Film Festival last year. Um, and I was very keen, you're very keen to say, look, please don't just think of this as a film about a woman with cancer, because it's a love story and all that. But I have, I have genuinely spoken to dozens of women who came up to me in both London and Toronto and said, I've been through this, and I found this film joyous, and I'm really glad you've made a film that's such an honest and accurate portrayal of what the process is like, you know, and I, I would never have wanted to be involved in a film that sugar-coated or sentimentalized this very serious subject. But all these women loved the fact that the, that for Tom and Joan, the li life goes on. Yes, you've, you're dealing with all of this and it's painful, but you've still got to go to the shops and you don't suddenly have a sense of humor bypass if you've got a sense of humor. And this couple have. They laugh a lot. There's a lot of love and humor in it. So I took great comfort from that. Not that I, I love, I love the film, not just because I'm in it. I love it. I love the tenderness and it's just a beautifully told and shot story. But f really from the horse's mouth, so many women have said to me, thank you for making this film about something I've been through. It felt like the greatest representation and it made me feel very happy. Uh, so, but I think people will take different things from it. But it isn't, it is many things, these, this film, but I want to, ring home the fact that one of the big things it is, is a middle-aged love story, which is quite a rarity these days in this modern, current climate of cinema. Um, it's always been a rarity, to be honest. Well, actually, you're right. You're, you're absolutely right. I mean, it, it's actually, I, I, I'd like to hope that it's, you, I mean, there are far more interesting parts now for women of my age. That is getting better. But it is so great to see a couple, I mean, both Liam and I are in our 60s, and it's great to see this couple still functioning as a couple who, you know, it's, sex isn't something they said goodbye to 10, 20 years ago. It's still very much a part of their life and very embroiled with their love for each other. Well, you know, I'm curious about um, your thoughts on this is that, you know, Joan and Tom sense the, the, the loss of their daughter have been, and it's touched on a little bit in a, in a scene that you have near the end of the film, they've kind of been living day to day. Yeah. And I don't mean hand to mouth, and I don't mean that in a depressing, sad way. I just mean that they take life day to day, and mm. that's how they live together. And the diagnosis and the treatments have kind of forced them to think about the future, even though it helps them comfortably take it day by day, they have to think about what this is gonna look like, how you're gonna feel, what happens if it doesn't work out, yeah. what, what that's gonna look like, how yeah. that affects their relationship, suddenly having to think about the future in some way. Yeah, because I think that um, since the death of their daughter, which is some 10 years previous, their lives have, not in a morbid way, 
but in a way that I would imagine something like that would, how it would affect you. They kind of close down. It's, it, it's, it's kind of reduced down to something smaller and much less sociable. And they, they, they entertain themselves through their, their relationship. You know, they do their, their power walking and they've got their little routines and they, they go to the shops together. And um, it's the small stuff of life. But yes, it does force them to look at, look ahead, and it's very nice, fine brushstroke when they invite the, the 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 guy who dies from it. There's only really two other people in the film, isn't there? The 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 couple who the, one of them is their daughter's ex teacher, and he, in the course of the film, dies of cancer, and his partner is left to deal with it, and they invite him over for. Um, Christmas. This idea uh, that this has actually opened them up a little bit. It has opened them up a little yeah. bit, yeah, yeah. Um, one more question uh, from Nigel right here. Hey, Nigel. Hi. Hello. Hi, how are you doing? Um, I'm looking forward to seeing you in the, the visit at the National oh, next week. Next uh, week? Next week. Uh, wow. So um, the question I have leads me to question. Um, I'm English. So I'm, I know you have more from theatre and film right. and TV. When you kind of um, selecting a new project, I know it always starts with the script and the director. Yeah. Do you have a preference, considering you've worked with Mike Lee, Sam Mendes, in both in theatre and film? Do you gravitate towards a particular genre, the theatre versus film? No, I love I love working. I, I work in all medium, really. You know, theatre, stage, and television. And I love I love. I love them all equally and for different reasons. I mean, I do get a bit itchy if I don't do a play for a year or two um, I, because I, I love the control that affords me. And when I mean control, I don't mean that I, I'll rehearse it for six weeks and then once we open it, I'll ignore everything the director said. But the, the, the evening is very much the actor's responsibility. It, you begin it and there's this whole arc and it's going to end and nobody can cut it, nobody can... Um, put their stamp on it it's it's your it's the stamp that you've put on it in collaboration with everyone else the directors and the rest of the acting team over a course of six seven eight week rehearsal period and I like that but then I equally like the challenges of television which can be very quick um, I mean I always go to work very prepared um, I you know I always know my lines but I love that thing of, right, okay, we've got two hours to shoot this scene. And I love the feeling of, right, okay, let's do this. We've got to do it quick, but I want it to be fabulous. And I want to this, this, and this. I, 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 lo I love it all. And then the, the kind of rather joyous, timely uh, landscape of working with Mike Lee or Paul Thomas Anderson when you've got, you know, 14 weeks to shoot a film, which is you know 14 weeks to shoot maybe less than two hours worth of of film it's 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 gorgeous i'm i'm very lucky to work in all three um but when i'm you glad you're coming to see the visit next week <laughs> uh when you have 14 weeks to shoot a film and we we describe the process where with paul you know he's experimenting and figuring out a lot on the set but from what i've always understood with mike he has by the time the cameras are rolling he's essentially figured out beat by beat what the, story, what the, what the, what the movie is. Yes, one, once you start filming with Mike, it's true that, I mean, what happens with Mike really is that we just take a different route. He is taking a different route to arriving at a script. Right. He, he does that route, not on his own as a writer at home. He does it in collaboration with the actors and they create the characters, they create improvisations. And out of all of those improvisations, he is the only one with the overall view of the whole thing, will go away and construct a story, but with very thumbnail sketch um, ideas put down on paper. Then we start to really improvise them and detail them so that every time we shoot a scene, it, we say the same lines we're not improvising on camera which i think is a myth uh, people yeah. think a lot of the time that we just roll the camera and see what happens and nothing could be further from the truth i don't know how people have ever gotten that myth from watching those movies. no i know like, you watch uh, because movies, you could tightly structured scenes completely but you couldn't shoot a movie if everyone was saying different things in every take it would be chaos but we never have it written down 
But we, we go over and over and over. He makes sure we're comfortable and that we absolutely know what we're saying. Mm. But um, it's... That's a process for naturalization. I mean, I, I yeah. imagine, like, by the time you... The cameras are actually rolling. You are incredibly comfortable with the words that are being said. Yes. Well, yeah, you are, and you're incredibly comfortable with that character. He could put that character in any situation, and you, you, you wouldn't be lost as to how to behave because you've created that character. It's usually about five or six months with Mike before you start shooting, and then maybe a, you know, ten, twelve week shoot. So they're long. They're long gigs, but they're thrilling, yeah. and and. You know, he was the man really responsible for uh, opening the door to the fact in my young mind, I was 23 when I met him, that I could play characters that weren't like me. What was the first one you did with him? Grown Ups, a BBC yeah, yeah. film. Um, you know, it was, it was thrilling and, and that was key to me. Oh, I can play somebody who's socially class-wise it, it, it is so different from me and that's been my my thing it, it thrills me to play this character who's tender and lovely and then do somebody like the character I play in The Visit that you're going to see next week what character over the course of your career would you say is most like you Ooh, well there's bits you know I'm somebody asked me this the other day did I talk to you about my series, Mum? Did I yeah, come in? You, yeah, yeah, we did, didn't we? I mean, I'm, I, like, I think I've been a good mother myself, I, although there's this character called Kathy that I play in a BBC series called Mum. And she's the personification of patience, isn't she? And love and every, wonderful, a sort of wonderful human being. I, I've been a good mum, I know that. Been a really good. I've loved being a mother, but I'm not quite as patient as her. So there's a bit of me in. <laughs> well, no one is, right? No like, one is, yeah. and I'm a bit more judgmental. But there are aspects of me in Kathy, and um, there are aspects of me in um, the the monster that I play in the visit. But, but in that, sometimes that somebody will push me so much, and I will just tell them as it is, rather than pussyfoot around it. Um, you don't seem like much of a pussyfooter. Although I've never seen it, but you seem to to work as fast and as much and as to be as admired as you are. I imagine that you are fairly uh, to the business when you are working. We, but not in a. I th I I I, th I think I'd be right. You mean that in a pejorative no, way? No, no, no. I know. I think I can say, with all in 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 no, without fear of anyone ringing up and saying no she's not like that i'm really quite easy to work with but i also i know my mind as well and i'm i don't like liam we don't we didn't bring any ego to the set we don't expect to be treated in any particular way i just wasn't brought up like that you know i i spent too many years working in very poorly paid theater to have any grandiose ideas about myself. Um, and it doesn't get good work done. You know, yeah. I, 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 I scared hate it edge. when I work with actors who, are, who come in with bringing something and that's not to do with what they're there to do. Because yeah. it only really tells you that they're not comfortable in their own skin at the end of the day. So, um, yeah. Um, well, I love the film. Congratulations. Another Thank amazing you. performance. Thank uh, you. Uh, when can people see Ordinary Love? How can people see it? It's in cinemas. It opened on Valentine's Day. Oh. You see? Because it's a love story. <laughs> it opened on Valentine's Day uh, in, uh, here and in L.A. and then across the rest of America imminently. And people can see you uh, in the National Theatre at the National Theatre right now. At the National Theatre right now through till... Um, early first week of May in Tony Kushner's version of The Visit. Amazing. The great Leslie Manville, everybody. Let's hear it. Thank you.